Okay, well welcome everyone. Uh, this is part of the Environmental Matters webinar series with the City of Superior Environmental Services and we have more topics on water. Um, for the webinar, you there is a question box. You may write in questions and we'll and Christy will go over those at the end. Um, otherwise all participants are muted now and we'll go ahead and begin today's webinar. Christy Turson is an engineering technician and stormwater specialist with the City of Superior here in Environmental Services Division of Public Works. She has a certificate in water technology from the University of Milwaukee and has taken numerous classes on water, man water management systems. She works with the commercial and larger development site permitting in the City of Superior. Her presentation coming right up is packed with information about water and how we can slow water down. Thank you, Christy, for being part of the series, and let's welcome Christy. Hi, everybody. Thanks for taking a little bit of time to watch this. I've uh, never done one of these before, so hopefully it goes well. So, as Wendy said, I work for the City of Superior, and I've been working here since 2006. Um, my webinar today is called Where's the Slow Water? And we'll get right into it. Um, the first thing uh, that I'd like to go over before we get into the why, or the how of the slow water, is why it's worth talking about. A lot of the time it's required by state statutes or local ordinances. Larger sites have to do this if they disturb an acre of land. Um, but in the bigger picture, like we said, this is important. All the things that we would like to do, those would be considered domestic and recreational purposes. Agriculture, commercial, and industrial uses. Water consumption. Um, so now we know how to mine is keeping the water clean and it's safe that we can get around here if we want. But how does that really Um, 
an excuse, excuse me. Christy, I'm just checking yeah. if you could check on your mic. The sound is going in and out. In and out. Well, that's not ideal. Let's see. I don't know if other people are having difficulty hearing it. Well, I'm plugged in all the see, way. And whether you hold it differently, just make sure you're speaking into the mic better. All right. Let's do, let's do that. Is that a little bit better? I cannot hear you. I can't hear me at all. I heard you the last time. All right. How about now? Now, very good. All right. I'll just have to. Keep keep speaking as close to the mic as you can. Okie dokie. I will do that. I I know. So speak into the mic. Yep. The check I heard. Yeah. It's going in and out. I wonder if you should call in. Okay, I can do that. And sorry, I'd say start over. Because <laughs> I think it was just going in and out too much. Thank you. Excuse the delay. The practice went smoothly. <laughs> So she is calling in, and we are trying to get better sound quality so we can hear her great presentation. Again, sorry for the delay. We hope she'll be tuned in. Okay. I am called in. Can you hear me now? Very good. Very good. Very good. Yay. Okay. Well, let's try this. I again. think if you can restart over is the best because it was just too in and out. Okay. We'll try this again. Let me just mute my speaker because now I'm getting feedback. All right. How's that? Can you still hear me? Very good. Okie dokie. And let's welcome Christy. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that, guys. So we'll go back to the beginning. And so before we get into how you slow water, I'd like to take just a little bit of time to talk about why it's worth talking about. Um, a lot of the time we do, we slow the water because it's required by state statutes and or local ordinances. For example, any site that disturbs one acre or more while they're doing a construction project has to do this um, and take into consideration the effect that their project will have on the site afterward. But in the bigger picture, and simply put, it is important because it directly relates to water quality. All right. Water quality can be looked at in several different ways. For our purposes, we'll talk about it in generic terms of different uses. Uses that help define the quality of a water body or resource can include public and private water supplies. So can we use the water for our drinking supplies or any other uses that we would need? Propagation of aquatic fish or other wildlife species, both domestic animals as well. So can the habitat support the environment and the habitat around? Um, domestic and recreational purposes, um, are we able to fish? Are we able to swim in the water, for example? And agricultural, commercial, and industrial uses. Can we use the water to irrigate our crops, for example? 
So now we know the bottom line is to keep the water clean and in a state that we can use for all the ways that we need or want. But how does that relate to slowing down the water? We'll get there, I promise. But first, let's take a quick look at the water cycle. First, we need to understand that all the water on Earth is all the water on Earth. Water is not created, it's merely recycled. Water is stored on the Earth's surface as liquid in oceans and lakes and as a solid in glaciers and snow. With the sun's heat, energy, or other natural processes, some water is transformed into gas and rises. This can happen from bodies of water and from plants and is called evaporation or evapor evapotranspiration. As the water gets further up in the atmosphere, it cools and condenses and forms clouds. Water is stored in the clouds until conditions cause the water to fall from the, earth, from the clouds to the earth as precipitation. When that precipitation falls, some gets intercepted before it gets to the ground by trees or plants. What does make it to the earth can flow along the surface as runoff or enter and become part of stream flows or can infiltrate into the ground. The stuff that goes over land ends up back into our storage, um, for either fresh water or an ocean. And the portion of it that infiltrates ends up into a different storage area underground. And that can be aquifers or just underground storage that's used to um, replenish our streams. That's the part that we're going to focus on is the infiltration component of the cycle. So now I'd like to talk a little bit about impervious surfaces. Well, what are impervious surfaces? Impervious surfaces are surfaces that prevent water from soaking into the ground as it would naturally. When water can't infiltrate as it would normally, it has to go someplace else. And as we just looked at in the water cycle, infiltration is a very important part of the water cycle as it recharges our groundwater reservoirs, which we use for drinking water in a lot of places. And also it has subsurface flows, which contribute to both flows, base flows and streams. Very important. So some examples of impervious surfaces include the obvious paved roads, parking lots or parking complexes, and buildings. Some other examples that may not be as intuitive would include graveled roads. They're compacted and don't allow the water to infiltrate as it would normally. Similarly, any recreational trails that are used. And also areas that have been, that were vegetated at one point, but have been utilized for parking, causes the vegetation to, uh, to die. And then you end up with a situation again where water isn't infiltrating as it would normally. And when water is prevented from entering the ground that it would normally, the water that falls has to react differently. So we're going to take a look at how that reaction differs between developed and natural environment. So here's a couple questions to think about. How much development or impervious area does it take to cause an effect? And how much does development affect infiltration? So in the upper left-hand corner, we have our natural ground cover. And then you have an example of 20 to 10 to 20% impervious area on the upper right. The lower left shows 35 to 50% impervious. And the lower right shows 75 to 100% impervious. If you look in the upper left in the natural gown cover, you can see that it has about 10% runoff. This is in a natural state. When you move over to a 10 to 20% impervious surface area, you can see that doubles the amount of runoff, which is pretty substantial. Our infiltration still looks pretty good, but we do have a significant amount more of runoff. When you get to a 35 to 50 percent impervious situation, you end up having a bigger effect on your infiltration. If you move to 75 to 100 percent impervious, you can see that now we have a lot more runoff on the surface, and we have really affected the amount of infiltration that goes in. So you can see there's substantially less water infiltrating, which recharges groundwater and subsurface flows, and much more runoff when you have a fully developed area. OK, so, so what? The water travels differently, but doesn't it get to the same place anyway? Well, that's a good point. And it may be true to a point, but here's the why it's important part. When there's an increase in surface flow and a decrease in infiltration, there are changes in the receiving water bodies that can be particularly detrimental to streams. With less infiltration, 
in a watershed, the base flows, or the amount of water that you would normally find in a stream, becomes lower. Sometimes this can get to the point where they dry up completely. With no water, we have no uses. That's a big problem. Fish don't like it when there's no water. They don't tend to survive really well. Also, with water flowing over the impervious surfaces as it goes to some of these receiving waters, it picks up a lot of the pollutants along its way. These may um, include the obvious litter items, but also the not so obvious items like heavy metals that come off of brake pads on cars or leaking fluids from cars. When there's nothing but a pipe between the road and the water, I'm sure you can see that the pollution picked up along the way goes to the stream or lake too. Again, this impairs the, dis the uses that we discussed earlier. So I have a couple slides to demonstrate um, what I was just talking about. This slide shows a little bit about the way or the timing on how water ends up in a lake or stream and how it changes from an urban to a developed area. So on this chart, time is shown on the bottom and the rate of flow is shown along the side. You can see from the graph, graph that the difference between the rural, urban and rural settings differ almost immediately in the time after a rain event. The change is twofold. There's more volume of water, which is the area under the line, and it gets there faster. That's the peak where those arrows are showing. In your urban condition, you can see the peak is much higher. So there's a lot more water that gets there, and you can see it gets there a lot faster than it would in a normal situation. And this is a big deal. So this slide, uh, I was taken from the UW Extension and Minnesota Greek Sea Grant, who work who developed and used it as part of their Views from a Lake program. So thank you to them, and I encourage you all to check them out. They have tons of great information. So this slide will demonstrate the blue line um, is your stream. And this is about the size that it is in a natural condition. Under natural conditions, you would have slow amounts of water reaching that stream. As we increase the impervious surfaces, we see faster movement of more water to the nearest stream or lake. As we showed in the previous graph, this leads to stream flows increasing very rapidly after rainfalls to higher levels than when otherwise normally occur. So those arrows are showing they're going to, everything's being directed to the roads. And then it gets condensed onto those roads, and it's directed to the streams via major channels or the roads. Then you can see that the amount of water increases outside of that stream bank. So and this can lead to unintended side effects such as flooding and stream bank erosion. And the effect is greater further down the stream you go in a developed watershed. So you can see up here in the upstream end, there isn't a whole lot of change compared to what it was. But when you go way down, now you've got water that's way outside the banks of where it normally would be. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about um, what we have in Superior. This image, I know it's a little tough to see, but it shows what we have for our drainage boundaries for our outfalls, and it also has our storm sewer system on it. So each one of those different colored areas represents an area that's drained by pipes and then goes to an outfall. So you can kind of see that we have several areas that are serviced by separate storm sewers. But you can also see there's an area right up in here, and also a large area through here that doesn't have any, any color around it. That is an area of our city that is combined. So our storm water goes into our catch basins and into pipes, which is then um, directed with our wastewater to our treatment plant. And then this slide shows the watersheds within our city, along with the designated and impaired water bodies. This relates back to um, the why we're talking about it and how we want to maintain our uses. This impaired information comes from the Wisconsin DNR, and it can be found on their website if you look for what's called the 303D listing. 
And on that, they show why things are impaired, whether it's because there's too much sediment coming in, which fills in fish habitat and causes problems for that, or if it's from heavy metals. Um, so you can see is that the city of Superior is basically surrounded by impaired water bodies, the St. Louis River, Howard's Bay, St. Louis, or Lake Superior itself, Barker's Island Inner, Hog Island Inlet, and then the Wisconsin Point Beach. So, and also we have Newton Creek and the Lower Nemagi, and they're all impaired water bodies. So we have a lot of concerns for our uses around here. Now I want to go over a little bit of what we have for an impervious area in Superior. The city of Superior within the city limits is roughly 15% impervious overall. But this isn't necessarily completely reflective of what is going on, because we don't have necessarily all of our roads digitized. And it's taking into consideration the whole city area, including areas that are reserved for parks and things like that. It's also not specific to a single watershed. And that's more important when you're talking about flooding potential and local water quality within the receiving water body. So you can see on the image there, all of that maroon colored stuff that's what we have as impervious area. You can see there's quite a bit. You can also see there's a lot of areas that don't have any of that. Those are areas that are mostly parks and stuff. For example, you can see that that's the municipal forest. The, uh, this image shows some of those specific areas, municipally owned rec, rec areas. So we have the municipal forest over here. This is the Namaji Golf Course, the Wisconsin Point Beach. And then you can see there's several little parks throughout the system. So you can see that there's a correlation between what we have for impervious area in this image and where we have our recreational areas. Now if we dial down a little bit further, and we look more specifically at what we, what, what's known as a district within our city. This is uh, our sewer district number two, highlighted with the bright blue. And within that, all that bright pink is the impervious. So this district contains approximately 45,000 square feet of land. And of that, approximately 24,000 square feet is impervious. This means it's about 50%, 53% impervious, which is similar to our lower left scenario on this image, where we have the 35 to 50% impervious. It's closer to that than it would be to the 10 to 20%. So we've got a pretty significant amount of impervious surface. So again, going back to the couple questions that I had, how much development does it take to cause an effect? Not really a whole lot. And how much development affects infiltration? Well, it affects it a lot in the different ways that the water ends up having to go. All right, so I would said that it's more important to think about things that is watershed. So we'll take a look at Faxon Creek. Faxon Creek is the largest watershed within the city limits. It contains about 3,350 acres of land, and of that, about 850 acres is impervious. This is, comes out to be about 25% impervious. OK. So now that we kind of understand where we're at and why we're talking about this, what can help slow the water, um, which actually helps clean it in the process and, and helps with our uses that we're, we're wanting to have? So there are several different BMPs used in Superior. So what is a BMP? Well, BMP stands for Best Management Practice. Basically, it's a way to handle water in a better way than just putting it in a pipe and putting it into the lake or stream. So each one of the systems that I'm going to briefly cover right here, I'm going to go into a little bit more detail in the following slides. So BMPs that we use in Superior include wet retention basins, also known as ponds. Those are 
usually regional and they treat a large area. We also have swales, which are commonly called ditches, um, and those are used for conveyance. We also have various types of infiltration systems, and like I said, I'll get into some details in a little bit here. We also have dry detention basins, underground storage systems, tree boxes, and these are actually upcoming. Um, I don't have a lot of information on that because it's a relatively new item within the city of Superior. Pervious pavers, um, again, it's a relatively new system to be used in the city of Superior. Um, the example that I'm going to talk about a little bit is going to be um, they're utilizing um, this system, this type of system, on portions of the new Super 1 in the East End that's being built as we speak. And the last two that are coming up here, rain gardens and disconnected impervious, I don't have a lot of details as to how often they're utilized within the city, but they're very viable options for homeowners, and I know that they are used in Superior. So disconnected impervious can mean a range of things, but most commonly, it refers to a way that roof drains are connected to a vegetated surface, maybe even a rain garden or a rain barrel, instead of being directed into a driveway, which then is typically connected to a road, which typically has curb and gutter and goes into a pipe, and then ends up in the stream without having any contact over a vegetated surface, which is not good. You end up with a lot of pollution coming down that way. I also want to touch briefly on, oh, that's next, hold on. So this slide shows some of the locations of the city-owned stormwater management systems, including wet and dry detention basins, but it doesn't include our swale system. So you can see here is highlighted the Billings Park Pond, and I'll go into some detail on that one later. Similarly, we have a water quality pond down in South Superior. We also have a couple dry ponds. There's Butler Pond and our airport pond. And there's a pond up here, which is the Vindry Industrial Park. We also have a couple out on Barker's Island that are used as well. So I do want to talk just a minute about systems that are used in other places around the country and world that we don't currently use here, at least that I'm aware of, um, either by the city or by private property owners. The first one is green roofs. Uh, that's exactly what that sounds like. It's a roof that's covered with soil and plantings. There is a building on the College of St. Scholastica's campus that recently installed a version of this. And also, there's several of them um, in the Milwaukee area and in Chicago. If you look online, you'll find many, many, many examples of how these are utilized in some urban areas. There's also on-site water reuse. This can uh, include collecting runoff to use within a building for items such as flushing toilets. There's good examples of this use in other countries for sure and possibly in the US on the West Coast. I know there's what are called eco-blocks being developed and installed over in the Asia area that have really good examples of how water reuse on-site can be um, can be sustainable and affordable. Pervious pavers, porous asphalt, and permeable concrete are all different types of kind of the same thing, so that you would have a hard surface to drive on, but it would allow some water to get through. Um, currently in Wisconsin, there is a technical standard being developed, so hopefully we'll start seeing a lot of more of these systems in the near future. There are many examples of how these can be used, even locally. UMD has a few different test sites where they install different types of these systems and have done some studies on them. Iowa, I know, has several utilized um, within their city, too. And the big one is Chicago. They have a Green Ag Alley program, which has been very successful for them. And I would encourage you to look at that for more information on, on how they've done um, that, those types of systems um, in their city. Um, there's also what's known as online and offline rain gardens. Um, online and offline just refers to if it's in the direct path of flow of the water or if parts of the water are um, directed to them so that 
if there's a lot of water, it doesn't necessarily all go there and flood out the system. Um, I know that these have been used especially in Seattle and many other places as well. Um, the last one I wanted to touch on was constructed wetlands. These are very technical and they use a lot of surface space to install correctly. They are very effective um, and I know they've been utilized in the U.S. However, from what I can find, it appears that they've been utilized more on the wastewater side of things. So those are a bunch of uh, different systems that are used elsewhere um, that could potentially be viable in the city here as well, but just not yet. So we'll go into each one of these in a little bit more detail. So we have our wet detention basins. These are very, very common. They've been along, around for a long time and are kind of the standard go-to. Um, they're also known as wet ponds or stormwater ponds or re wet retention ponds or wet extended de detention ponds. They go by many, many names. But they're basically constructed basins that have a permanent pool of water throughout the year or at least throughout the wet season. Ponds treat incoming water. Uh, stormwater runoff by allowing the particles to settle and algae to take up nutrients. The primary removal mechanism is settling as stormwater runoff resides in this pool and the pollutant uptake particularly of nutrients also occurs, occurs through biological activity in the pond. The city of Superior actually has several of these in town, both city and privately owned. I'm going to go into a little bit more information and show you some information on our Billings Park, which was the latest install in the city. But before I look at that, I'm just going to kind of go over briefly the schematic here. So basically, you have a pipe that has carries water into the pond, and you have what's known as a floor bay. So it's basically a, a smaller area that is used to collect a lot of the heavy sediment. And then you can see there's a water quality elevation. So this is basically the, the level of the water um, as it would be normally. And then you have some plant life in there and you have your outlet structure. So that basically you have a small diameter outlet that slows the water down. So you have a bigger pipe coming in and a smaller pipe going out. And that helps slow the water and it also helps allow for treatment. You also have um, emergency overflow um, items installed as well, so you don't worry about flooding out where you don't want to flood out. So looking at Billings Park, this one was just installed not too terribly long ago, and the red lines on here are the pipe components of the system. So you can see that we're taking a lot of water from a very large area, and then it comes down in the pipe and it enters the pond. This pipe represents the outlet, and then it flows down, and it goes out and discharges into the St. Louis River. So it's a very large project, and it actually ends up being a very large pond. One thing I would like to note here is that not only is there curb, gutter, and pipe portions, but there are several areas within this system that have um, swales that you are utilized to convey until it gets to a point where there's a part, pipe. So this is an image of what the pond looks like. And I know it's a little bit hard to see, but if you look way in the back, you can see a little structure um, down there. That is the, the main inflow into the pond, or the low flow inlet into the pond. So this means that most of the time, water that gets into the pond enters from that far end. Then you can also see there's a much larger pipe in the foreground of the picture there. And that pipe is called the high flow or high capacity overflow. And if you, look, if you were to look into that pipe just, um, just upstream of where it enters the pond, there's basically a little wall. And that little wall prevents the water from flowing into that pipe until the level of the water is higher than that wall. So that keeps the water flowing all the way down to the far end most of the time, unless there's a large rain event and it reaches the level of that wall. And at that point, the water would start flowing out this high capacity overflow. The outlet is, the main outlet is this big concrete structure. 
And on the pond side of it, there's a, an 8-inch orifice that allows the water to flow down. So you can see it, it's a much smaller outlet than there is from an inlet, particularly in the high capacity. Um, in most cases, water is only exiting the pond through the small hole. On top of that structure, where the arrow, blue arrow is pointing, um, it's a big open area and it's covered by a grate. So if the water level does get really high in a major water event, a rain event, the water can flow freely over the top of that wall and get out faster so we're not flooding out. And also there's a grate in the very front part here that is another overflow. So if the water level gets even higher, then the water can start flowing in here. And if the water gets even higher than that, way down on the far end over here, the berm around is slightly lower so that if there's a major, major rain event, we're not going to go over the berm and flood all the houses that you see. It's going to exit over the back here into um, a natural drainage way. So that's basically the, the components of that pond. And next, I would like to talk about swales. Swales are used to move water from point A to point B. They provide a method that's much lower, particularly in small rain events, than your typical curb and gutter to a pipe. They also provide additional benefits compared to the curb and gutter pipe system in that they allow for some infiltration into the native soils. They allow for some water uptake by the vegetation within the swales. Grass uses water, and they'll use the water that goes through the swales to, um, for the growth. And plants also filter out some of the particles that are in the runoff and are effective at removing certain pollutants that are difficult to remove with your traditional pond systems, specifically your hydrocarbons or your um, oils. Um, are much more effectively removed from your stormwater runoff with vegetation and swales than a pond, for example. They come in many different shapes and sizes, and I have several example folders from around town um, because I think Superior is very lucky to have a very good swale system. You'll see that some are a little more shallow than others, some have more vegetation than others, some hold more water than others for longer periods of time, but they all basically function the same. So here's an example of one that's relatively shallow, um, but again, it's very effective in conveying the water and also giving it um, some treatment, and it slows it down compared to a pipe. And underneath any sidewalks or driveways, there will be a little culvert. So if you're a homeowner and you have a, a swale in front of your house and it's holding lots of water, the one thing that you can do is to check if there's a, a pipe that has any leaves or sticks or debris that's clogging it and just remove that. Um, also, if you maintain that, that system in front of your house and you mow it, you can try really hard to not keep a lot of the grass clippings in there. That also helps um, with preventing those, those pipes from clogging up. Here's an example of a little bit deeper of a system. We actually went and did an inventory on several places, um, several of our systems throughout the city. Um, and I'm sitting there with a string so we can get some geometries measured out on it. We also have um, some other ones that have, now this one's a, quite a bit deeper than the previous two. Um, it doesn't have a whole lot of vegetation in it, but it does have enough to make a difference, and it goes for a pretty substantial um, distance. Here's one that's holding a little bit more water than some, and it's taking it a little bit longer to drain down, and it's a fairly good um, depth, and you can see that where the water lies in that one. There's also um, a couple examples here from the Billings Park area where the swales are extremely deep and they have a lot of vegetation in them. Bioretention areas um, are, in essence, rain gardens, but they're engineered specifically um, with 
certain types of soil and certain depths and sometimes can include pipes underground to help um, make sure that the water doesn't drown out the system, basically. So these are basically landscaping features that uh, adapted to provide on-site treatment of stormwater runoff. They allow com they are commonly found in parking lot islands or within small pockets of residential land uses. Surface runoff is directed into shallow landscape depressions. These depressions are designed to incorporate many of the pollutant removal mechanisms that operate in forested ecosystems. During storms, runoff ponds above the mulch and the soil of the system. Eventually, it infiltrates, or it may get to a level that it goes into an overflow. Um, or in larger rain events, it may be directed away from that system. Uh, the remaining runoff filters through the mulch and the soil mix, and the filtered runoff can be collected in perforated under drains and returned to the storm drain system. We have a couple examples, um, well, we have a couple that are being built at the Super One location right now, and the CVS um, installed these at their location recently, too. Um, here's kind of a schematic of a general, generally what they would look like. You basically have a depressed area where water can pool up. Then you have an overflow for a lot of water because you don't want to flood it out. Then you have your engineered mix, and then you would have plants growing here that would help uptake pollutants and water. And it would slowly infiltrate through your engineered soil into your under drain and then out into your storm sewer system. Dry detention ponds are also known as dry ponds or extended detention basins, detention ponds, extended detention ponds. Again, they have several names, but they are systems that are designed to hold water during a rain event and release it slowly over an extended time frame, typically 24 to 72 hours, but not to hold water permanently. This one um, particularly is located at our airport. Um, and the reason that, some of the reasons that why you would use a dry detention pond over a wet detention pond would have to do with the federal aviation regulations and they don't allow standing water located within a certain proximity of the airport because, well, when you have open water, you end up having birds and when you have birds, you can have problems with planes. So that's an example of why and where we have um, a dry detention basin in the city. We also are going to talk a little bit about underground storage systems. Typically, these you don't see. Um, the images that I have here are used with the permission of the site owner. And this particular site is the new Super 1 going in in, in Superior in the east end. Um, and you can see that it's a lot of pipe. and Basically, this will be buried and put underneath the parking lot. And again, the, the basic concept is that it takes the water from the runoff, or the runoff from the parking lot, and has this piping system that stores it, and then releases it over time. These pipes are particularly large. Um, that's me, and I'm about 5'2", so I think these are about 48-inch pipes. And there were several of them, so there's a lot of volume in there. And this is the smaller restrictive outlet from the system. So as it fills up with water, it is being let out slowly by the smaller pipe over time. Tree trenches are another good use in, in highly urban areas where you don't have a lot of space to use. Um, unfortunately, I don't have an image really for this one, as the only place that we're going to have these will be in the Tower Avenue rebuild, which is currently being done as we speak. Um, if you do look online for tree trenches, you'll find several images and other examples. Um, this particular image is a rendering from the Wisconsin DOT of how the Tower Avenue reconstruct will look. So you can see there's trees over here, and then here's a tree box um, where you have the tree, and then underground there's um, a system, and here's a schematic of basically how that would look. You have your curb and your gutter, and you have an open grade, and then you have soil for the tree to grow. So pervious pavement systems. Again, I don't have an image for this one. The only place that we're going to have this system in the city will be in two small sections in the new Super 1 location. But if you look online for pervious pavers or porous asphalt or permeable concrete, you can find lots of images and examples and information on where they've been used and how well they've performed and how they've held up over time. 
Um, personally, I would love to see this type of system installed out on our Barker's Island um, parking lot in combination with maybe a grass paper system, system to add a little more color and some cleanliness to the runoff. But that's just me. I'm keeping my eyes and ears open for grant funding opportunities on that one. And hopefully, we'll get something out there one of these days. Um, so this is a porous asphalt. And they have a fire hose running. And you can see there's no water. It basically just goes through. And there's um, underneath the system, there's a, a lot of engineered stuff that happens to make sure that there's capacity for the water and that there's the integrity on the surface so that you can have the loading that you need. The middle one here is a pervious concrete. And you can see there's lots of open spaces compared to what you would normally think of as concrete. And again, it allows the water to flow. And then down in the lower right-hand corner, this is an example of um, a pervious interlocking concrete paver system. And so basically, you have bricks, and there's spaces in between the bricks that are allows the water to go in into the um, engineered underground portion. And a couple of last considerations I'd like to just talk about. Um, each of the BMPs that we've kind of talked about or mentioned a little bit, uh, I know I didn't go into much detail, um, but there's a lot of information. And I was told 15 minutes of which I know I'm going over. Um, so there's um, each of them helps to slow the water and in various degrees. And each one of them also has different abilities to clean the water. So for each different project, one should take into consideration the overall goals of the BMP. Some of those considerations would be the source areas. Where is the runoff coming from? Is it coming from a high traffic road? Or is it coming from a tennis court at your local park? That can make a big difference in and of itself on determining what type of BMP to choose. Uh, the pollutants that will be present. Again, that kind of has to do with your source areas. If you have a high traffic road versus a tennis court, you're going to have different types of pollutants that are going to be around, and also a different amount of volume of water that's going to come off. Um, and the size of the area needing treatment, again, this is going to affect the pollutant amount that you're going to get and the volume that you're going to com have coming off of that area. And the other thing you know, to take into consideration is the amount of land available for treatment. If there's a lot of land space, you know, a pond may be a viable op option. But if you don't have a lot of land space, you may be needing to use something like an underground retention system that you can bury under the ground. Um, so that's a few of the things uh, that need to be considered when choosing the treatment um, BMPs for a site. And ultimately, it may be beneficial both economically, because we all know money makes the world go round, but environmentally as well to use notes known as a treatment train. This picture serves as an example of that. What it means is that you choose more than one BMP type, and you use them together in series to achieve your desired outcome. So in this example, they're using bioretention in the middle here with a curb cut. And they're using the um, permeable interlocking concrete pavers um, on the actual parking lot. Another example would be using a grass swales using grass swales to convey water to an infiltration system or a bioretention system. And then maybe even ultimately connect that to a pond. Um, it really all depends on the site and what you're trying to do and um, what, you're, what the project means. So that was a kind of a very quick overview of a lot of very technical information. and. Um, now I think uh, if there's any questions, I can turn it over to Wendy. OK. Thank you very much, Christy. Can you hear me? I can. OK, good. Um, it looked like a comment came in from one of the attendees on you had said there are no examples of green roofs in Superior. And you gave the new College of St. Scholastica a small roof they've put up. Uh, green roof, but the person did mention UWS Yellow Jacket Union does have a green oh, roof. Oh, yes. I apologize. I knew of that one, and I completely spaced it. But yes, yes, UW does have uh, a green roof on their, their new Yellow Jacket building. My apologies. And then there also just was a comment. She, the person, she really liked uh, seeing the local pictures and hearing about BMPs that are working locally. 
putting these in and then they are working. And now I see a question, does the city offer any incentives to businesses to implement any of these BMPs such as Super, Super One or are businesses doing these things on their own? Uh, that's yes and no. Uh, it depends on what the BMP is and how it's designed. So as I mentioned um, way in the beginning, a lot of the larger sites are required by law to do this. And if they're doing redeveloping an area or they're tearing down existing buildings and putting up a new building, for example, the requirements aren't um, very high. Whereas if they were taking it, um, a natural area and then putting a new building, then they would have different requirements. Um, so for the Super One uh, site for in specific, they were required to um, have 40% of their total suspended solid amount re reduced compared to um, with their controls um, compared to no controls after the site completed. Um, but because it was a redevelopment site, they were not required to do um, any type of attenuation. If they were to have done a, a brand new site on a, an undisturbed place, um, they would have been required to reduce their total suspended solids in their runoff by 80% and they would have been required to do attenuation or slowing the water down off of that site. As far as incentives that the city offers to businesses, we do have a credit program. And basically, if you put in um, specific BMPs, uh, wet detention ponds, dry detention ponds, underground storage, um, constructed wetlands, and I think I might be missing, missing one. And you install them so that they are reducing the amount of total suspended solids or pollutants, basically, in the water by 80% and um, or attenuating or slowing the water down compared to, um, as compared to the pre-existing condition for the one year, 24 hour, the two year, 24 hour, the 10 year, 24 hour, and the 100 year, 24 hour um, type two rain events, then we do offer some credits. If you get both of those, um, if you hit both of those marks with a pond, for example, the credit's close to 60%. But if you are treating the water and removing 80% of the solids, but unable to attenuate to the 100-year event, for example, then you would only get about 30% of the credit or half the amount. And basically, that's based on um, our stormwater utility breakdown and how um, the money that we receive from that is used for capacity and maintenance and things. And if people are doing activities on their site themselves that would reduce the city's amount of effort later on, that's where the credit justification comes in. And we do have information on of, of our credit program on our website if anybody is interested in more or feel free to email me. Um, uh, if you have specific questions about that. But um, in short, yes, we do have a credit program, um, and so we do have some incentives for people to install some specific type of BMPs. OK, and I don't see any other questions that have come in. I hope everyone has learned a great deal from this excellent presentation. And it was great. I know I learned uh, more about Superior and what's been going on. Uh, for slowing down water and handling the water and, and preventing pollution runoff. Uh, for just quick announcements then, with this Environmental Matters webinar series, the next one will be in two weeks, again Tuesday at noon and August, August 27th. Darian McNamara is uh, also with the City of Duluth and she will be speaking about wetlands and the special area management plans. Um, She's with the City of Superior. Right. Did I say Duluth? Uh oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> Slip City of Superior. Um, so she'll be the guest uh, on that one. And then we have two more in September, or one on organic yard care and one on climate change. These uh, webinars will continue throughout the rest of the year to a month. And as an incentive for Superior City of Superior uh, attendees, then you can win a free compost bin. We are giving away a compost bin in November to a City of Superior resident attending these. Uh, another little 
upcoming event is we have a storm drain stenciling coming up next Tuesday night at 6 uh, for helping label storm drains with the message of do not dr dump drains to streams. Um, that we want to, local people to be involved with helping that and getting that message out. So thank you very much, everyone. And um, sorry again for the delay of te because of technical difficulties at the beginning, but thanks for sticking with it. And thank you again, Christy. Thank you. Have a nice day, everyone. Bye-bye.